have the third lecture uh, on Hamiltonian formalism of general relativity and numerical relativity. So uh, today I'm just starting to, uh, in this lecture, sorry, I'm going to just start to prepare the ADM formulation of general relativity because I really need to introduce a lot of concepts. Uh, so I, I would like that you have at least some basic knowledge of these concepts because they may appear uh, in differential geometry, for instance, or um, in particular regarding the ADM formulation is something that you will find a lot if you go, for instance, uh, for approaches for quantizing gravity. It's very important to know these um, uh, to know these Hamiltonian methods. Uh, and then uh, lecture three, we'll have uh, we, I will finish the the ADM formulation, and I will start with the basics of numerical numerical relativity. But uh, since uh, it's uh, we we have not so much time, so we won't be able to put anything in a computer in there. But in in the case of general relativity, it's like very very important to know all the basic concepts before you start programming anything. So let's hope that these lessons, uh, they will be useful in case you are very interested in these topics. Um, so now for these lectures, I'm following uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, lectures that you can find like in a free preprint system. And uh, then for later, for the next lecture, I will mainly use this book. Um, and now an overview of my previous lecture. So we... Uh, concluded that the study of numerical relativity is very important and very well motivated from uh, these detections of binary black hole mergers that we are getting and we will continue getting in the future. And uh, predicting this behavior is not possible to do fully, fully analytically due to that uh, Einstein's equations are very nonlinear and we, we are in the presence of strong gravity regime. So what you are uh, studying now in the lectures of general relativity is very highly symmetric solutions, which is also, of course, important to, uh, it's important to study all the, uh, the simple solutions to Einstein equations, but always keep in mind that there are a lot of assumptions that you do in, uh, in this process. And in particular in cosmology, uh, what you are assuming is homogene homogeneity and isotropy, which is, of course, something that we observe in the sky. But then if we have some, uh, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic at large scales, but then what happens if you want to go to some not so large scale, but still cosmological? So there are some inhomogeneities and some studies of, for instance, not so homogeneous universes, which give you rise to more than one scale factor, and then things complicate and they are just more, no more uh, fully analytical. And also I introduced you to the Dirac algorithm for constraint Hamiltonian systems, so just in case it was too tedious, the mathematical presentation, I'm just showing the diagram here, uh, which is not so difficult to, uh, to follow, because you have already been introduced to Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. So uh, it's clear that we start physics from a Lagrangian formulation. Um, we define some canonical momenta, uh, some Poisson bracket, which in field theory and this gravity theory, it will be a commutator, but if you go for fermions, it becomes an anti-commutator, yeah? Uh, then you solve velocities in terms of uh, momenta and coordinate, and you compute, uh, you, you, you see that not all velocities can be solved, so this composed primary constraints, and at the same time, with these velocities and momenta, you build the canonical Hamiltonian. And then primary Hamiltonian is a combination of canonical Hamiltonian and a combination of primary constraints. And then this primary Hamiltonian is the one that uh, gives you the dynamics of uh, the dynamics of the of the constraints. So from all your set of primary constraints, you evolve in time with the primary uh, Hamiltonian. And I think here is they have to be uh, changed according to your notation. Uh, okay, but never mind. You impose that this equation is zero, and then uh, you can get either three results, an identity, more constraints, or restrictions on these three Lagrange multipliers. Uh, then you obtain new constraints, which you have to repeat, the, for which you have to repeat the process until you don't get more constraints. 
and then you make a specification on first and second class constraints. And these ones are the physically important ones. Um, and yeah, and we saw uh, as an example electromagnetism. And what I probably didn't tell you is that uh, electromagnetism, you consider spin one particle massless. If you put mass to the photon, what you get is second class constraints when the mass is different from zero. Yeah? So uh, from the derivation I, I made for you last week, uh, sorry, uh, last day, uh, I didn't show this uh, example because we were already running out of time. But if you put mass to the photon, and even if you put like some nonlinear term, uh, uh, in the in the Lagrangian, you get second class constraints, and in this case, are com are, are problematic second class constraints. They don't uh, uh, have like uh, they depend on the on the value of the mass yeah? or on the value of the fields. Uh, but now uh, let's go back to general relativity, and uh, there are some sort of mathematical concepts here that I would like you to to, to have some notion. And uh, first of all, you, I think you already have, you already know that space-time uh, is uh, some manifold uh, on, on whatever mathematical definition you do on, on manifolds, and it has a metric. Uh, space-time is like a, a, a set of a manifold and a metric. Yeah? And this metric will have this signature, minus, plus, 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 but you can also take plus, minus, minus, minus. Then you have to change the sign in the action as you saw in the relativity. And uh, they, we assume that the manifold we can have a time, uh, a, a time uh, direction, yeah. And we will assume also that this manifold that is time orientable, that you can give a direction of time, uh, it has a three-dimensional uh, hypersurface, and that this hypersurface you embed on space. So maybe this concept is better uh, understood with a picture, of course. So you imagine that uh, space-time, like everything you see, these three dimensions, is embedded in a four-dimensional space-time. But in these pictures, we will just remove one dimension, and we just go to two dimensions in three dimensions. Yeah. So this is uh, the embedding of a hypersurface, which is this a lower dimension section of, of, of space-time, and you embed it on a higher dimensional space-time. So for defining this hypersurface, I just need two coordinates, x and y. But if I want to define this hypersurface embedded on space-time, I need an extra dimension, right? For instance, if this was x coordinate, y coordinate, then if I just define this, if I just describe this hypersurface just here, then I, I just need two coordinates for, for describing any position here. But if I want to describe a position of something here in this hypersurface, I need a third dimension, which is, you could say, the set direction. Yeah? So this hypersurface is flat, and I can say that this, uh, let's say, set coordinate, when the set coordinate is zero, then I get this hypersurface, which you can imagine like an infinite plane. Yeah? So. Uh, this is like the mathematical concepts that uh, are involved for uh, for lead in space time, and uh, in particular, uh, there are some uh, defi mathematical definitions that when you go from you have a curve in this hypersurface and a vector, and then you do a push forward uh, of the curve and the vector in the in the uh, higher dimensional manifold. And then the action of taking these uh, two coordinate objects and going to three coordinate objects or three coordinate objects to four coordinate objects is called this, uh, this push forward. And then you can do the same. You can go from higher dimensional uh, description hypersurface and go into the lower dimensional uh, thing, and that's called a uh, pull forward. It's the opposite action. And then, yeah, this is like. Uh, the definition is that when you uh, pull back the metric, let's say you can have a metric uh, in this uh, hypersurface, and you make a pull, a pullback. Sorry, no, you have a, a metric here, and you do a pullback here, and you somehow reduce one dimension. Uh, that is called the induced metric, or the three-dimensional metric. 
of this hypersurface. So yeah, like just to, to have it clear. Here in space time, you have a metric. And then you need like an object with only three dimensional indices. So you do a pool, uh, yeah, a pullback here, and then you remove one uh, one dimension, and what you get there is the induced metric. Is this gamma that we look for? And this gamma can be uh, of three different kinds: space like, time like, time like, and moon, depending on the signature that has. Um, you already know that space-time in general relativity is a Lorentzian space-time, where the signature in one of the co in one of the directions changes. But we will want that our induced uh, metric, we will want that it is a Riemannian, it has a Riemannian uh, signature, which is only plus indices. This means that all the coordinates in my hypersurface they will be uh, space coordinates, not time. I won't have any time in this induced metric. Why? Because I want to study the time evolution of the, of the induced metric. So I cannot accept that it has this signature. And also I cannot accept that it's degenerated. Yeah? It means that I, I would have some, uh, like it would be just oriented in the surface of a light cone, and I don't want that. Yeah? And also, this induced metric will have a levi civita connection, uh, and I will denote it with a covariant derivative. Yeah? But this will be like a spatial coordinates for the levy chili, not time. And now, uh, as, I, as I told you in the example of the plane, I can, there is this coordinate set that if I put set constant, I, will, I define a, a, a surface, so you can think on this set as the time. For instance, like this surface, the evolution on time of this surface, it just go from uh, below to above, and then each, in each foliation, it changes the shape, so that will mean some sort of time evolution of the hypersurface. So that will be like simplifying very much things. This is like just two dimensions that evolve in time. Yeah. So the, in the equivalent, the, let's say the equivalent of this behavior would be to take this set coordinate like time, and then I define this plane by set equals zero or set equals constant. So this is um, we can generalize this to three dimen to four dimensions, and we can call this time the time function, the time that defines the hypersurface. Yeah? And then uh, you can define like a, a normal uh, to the leaves of evolution because it's not only necessary to have like a hypersurface, but also we would like to have some notion of perpendicularity to this hypersurface. And for that, we use this time function and we take the covalent derivative of the time function and we obtain a co-vector that has this mathematical property of being closed and uh, this uh, time function allows us to define a lapse function. Yeah? Somehow it defines how much, how, uh, how fast time, the time coordinate equals. Yeah? And then uh, I can also define another uh, another important concept is the shift function and I can define it in the following way so here you imagine that this uh, here I am even reducing more the problem I'm just taking two dimensions this will be time and this will be space so in space I just have one coordinate for denoting uh, here is like one coordinate yeah and then I have two hypersurfaces one here and one here so this notion of normal that I told you is this normal vector that goes from one hypersurface to the other, and it is perpendicular here. And this normal vector defines some notion of time, but this time is scaled by the lapse function. And uh, this normal vector does not necessarily hit in the same coordinate that I started here. Yeah? So for accounting this difference, I will use this shift function. It, it shows me how much the normal vector uh, deviated for, from the coordinate that I started with. And then if I want to, for instance, check what is the distance between a point in one hypersurface to another hypersurface, I also have to take into account that this point does not have the same coordinates as this one. So there is a change in coordinates. 
and then I can uh, you can make this generalization to four dimensions, and then what you the result that you will get is the ADN metric, the the Arnold Desen Wiesner metric, which will comp will be composed of the labs and the shift. So here is more or less how I explain it. Like you start in the point A here, then from A you project the normal vector and it lands at the point B. But this point B, it is shifted with respect to the original coordinate that I started by this, uh, by this measurement. So uh, with this uh, correction, I obtain the point C, which goes from time t plus t, because this is time t, and here it passed some time, and it became dt. Yeah? So the coordinates of the point C is t times dt, and exactly the coordinates that I started with. But now, I would like to represent how measuring distance is from this point to this point, and for that, I need to check what are the coordinates of this d point. And the coordinates are d plus d, xi plus dxi, which where this dxi is this thing. Yeah? And now, uh, so here is like, all that I explain is, uh, is also written here. And then I can measure distances between this point B, C, and D with the spatial metric, of course, because this, uh, as I mentioned you, the spatial metric, it measures distances in the hypersurface only. So here, how I measure distances is with the gamma ij, which is the, the, hyper, the spatial metric that I have in the hypersurface, the induced metric. And then uh, the line element, finally, of course, when I have time uh, differences, I put the minus sign, because that's my, let's say, the relativistic convention, is that time will go with minus sign when measuring space time, and space will go con with plus coordinates. And then this is the final result by measuring the distance between these two points. And this is uh, the Arnoid Descent Misner metric, or ADM metric from now on. And it was proposed in the 1960s, and it's kind of a very useful thing of the composing space-time because you consider uh, you are considering how to measure the, let's say, a change of coordinates in time and this change of coordinates in in space. Yeah. Uh, and then you can write this metric uh, in a mat matrix form, of course. And then you notice that with the lower indices, uh, in the lower indices. You have the 0, 0 component, 0i component, i0, and ij. Yeah? This is a matrix of 3 times 3. This is a vector of 1 times 3, 3 times 1, and this is one, just one component. And then the inverse of this matrix is this one. You can just check in your in, in paper, you can check that this matrix is the inverse of this matrix. And also, uh, it is useful to define this normal vector in this hypersurface. And the normal vector, uh, you can make, a, uh, you can make a, a, a choice of coordinates that in when the n is a, a, a vector with the indices down, it will go zero in the spatial sector, and in the time sector, it will go with the, with the last function, and then you compute the normal vector with the upper index, and for that you use this metric, and you just multiply this vector by this metric, and you obtain this normal vector uh, with the index up. Yeah? And now all these objects we will use for making the 3 plus 1 decomposition of item equations. Um, yeah, so, so far here, any uh, questions? We have somehow, yes? Uh, so the yeah, like here I am still not giving any equations of motion. So, but the equations of motion will tell you how this behaves and how all these components behave. For now, I'm just making the most general decomposition of a metric uh, that separates space and time. This is the most general one. Uh, for now, I'm not adding any gravity yet, but I will, and then you will check how this evolves in time. That's what finally I want to do. I want to check how gravity uh, evolves in time. Uh, like in the most 
pure way without setting any, well, I'm setting coordinates here, but I'm not setting any symmetries, uh, yeah, like in cosmology, for instance. Um, so here my interest is to make a split of space and time. So somehow I am just going totally against uh, the spirit of Einstein, which was treating space and time as the same thing. Here I'm doing totally the opposite. I'm just breaking this, breaking this covariance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. And now, um, the in intrinsic metric. There is a way of defining this intrinsic metric. I have, um, I have a mathematical way of obtaining this fixing metric in terms of a general metric and my normal vector. So you can check that if I uh, take the components of the metric, like any metric, and then I add this combination of the normal vectors, I will obtain an object that is purely special. And it has no components along the normal vector. So somehow I define this metric uh, I, I define this mathematical object with the normal vector that I define here, and I can prove that this, the resulting object is purely spatial. So somehow with this normal vector, I just define a notion of time. And then I define this thing, and this thing does not have any component along the normal vector. So you could, say, you could perfectly say that the hypersurface is uh, totally perpendicular, this hypersurface, which is pretty special, it doesn't have any component along the normal vector. So somehow the evolution will go like uh, the normal vector will guide, let's say, the curvature, the, how it curves the, the hypersurface. And also it is important, an important relation of this normal vector, it, it's that it has a, oh, I don't have it here, which is strange, but, a very important pro property of the normal vector, which you can derive from the expression that I put before, is this. That the normal vector is, let's say, uh, the norm of the vector is minus one. Yeah? So uh, taking this important property of the normal vector, I can find that if I contract this metric with the normal vector, I get zero. Therefore, the induced the induce metric does not have any components along the normal vector. And then I can also obtain the inverse uh, metric. Um, and uh, since this induced metric uh, doesn't have any uh, components along the direction of the normal vector, it can be used to project geometric objects also along the direction of the normal vector or in the direction perpendicular of the normal vector. So for instance, uh, if we want to project, if we take a tensor and we want only to take the spatial components, we project each one of these indices with, a, with an intrinsic metric. That's why the intrinsic metric is also called projector. This is also called projector, but it also turns out to be the intrinsic metric. So this perpendicular indicates that it doesn't have any component along the normal vector. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, I can define a normal projector, which is something that will always give me something along the normal vector, yeah? So somehow we, we know now how to take a tensor and take the part that only belongs to the space and we also have a, another mathematical object that gives you all the components of any tensor in or vector in the direction of the normal vector. Uh, so somehow we have this, uh, three plus one. we are working out these three plus one decompositions. And now, uh, yeah, I already told you that this metric defines a covariant derivative with the levi civita associated with this gamma, which only means that, well, it disappeared. It disappeared, the, the expression for the levi civita but if you remember, levi civita uh, tensor is written in terms of metric, and it has space-time components, so you will only take the special ones, and that will be the covariant derivative associated with this uh, intrinsic metric. Therefore, uh, since this, com this does not have any components in time, we can, as well, instead of writing the spatial indices, we, we can write the space-time indices. But we will know that every time we see a gamma, 
it will have only spatial indices. Why we want this? Because we want to somehow recover this covariance uh, again. We, can, we want to include time, but not including time. It's, uh, and the way of doing it is just, we include, we just include here the, the gamma with the indices in also in time, but we will know that the final result will only have spatial index, yeah? Uh, and then, yeah, uh, technically any object that you give to me, I can just apply these uh, gammas, and then it will have a special components. So in particular, we can do that to the Riemann tensor, yeah? Uh, but before, uh, we can define like the, the Riemann tensor in three dimensions. Um, uh, well, as you can uh, check from uh, differential geometry, the Riemann tensor is somehow uh, the difference on the on the commutation of covariant derivatives. Like somehow you you um, you are transporting a vector along the say two directions, and then you transport along one direction first, and then the other. And if you get some change, then you have curvature in a in a space time. So somehow here also in three dimensions, because I told you that these are three dimensions, you also get some notion of curvature, but in three dimensions. Yeah. Um, and you can also prove that this uh, three-dimensional curvature it is orthogonal to the normal vector because because it is only spatial. And now I can also define all three-dimensional quantities like a Ricci tensor, a Riemann, uh, a Ricci tensor in terms of a Riemann three-dimensional Riemann tensor, and a Ricci scalar in three dimensions also. And uh, I can go for searching uh, the 3 plus 1 decomposition of Einstein's equations in terms of this four dimension and three dimensions. So keep in mind when the Riemann has an upper index four, it means four dimensions, and here in, it means three dimensions. And uh, I have some notions of curvature now, like uh, curvatures on space-time and curvatures in the intrinsic surface in the intrinsic, let's say, intrinsic metric. So, these two kinds of curvature is something I would like to show you now the, the meaning. Uh, I will show you very soon with uh, ex very basic examples what, the, what is the difference. Uh, but this will be the intrinsic curvature and uh, it only has information about how the hypersurface is curved. But it's not that it has no information how it is embedded in the four-dimensional space-time, and therefore there is some missing information. How this hypersurface curves with regard to the four-dimensional space-time. Um, and that I have to define a mathematical object for it. And what is this object? Uh, it, it means it, it is an object that I will have to define with respect to the normal vector, because the normal vector somehow uh, okay, if I have this hypersurface, let's say, curved like this, then the normal vector goes this way, right? You can see that the curvature of this hypersurface in the four-dimensional space-time is somehow determined how fast this vector changes. If the surface is plane, then the vector doesn't change, right? So there is kind, kind of no curvature. But if it is very curved, then you see that the normal vector changes a lot, yeah? So this change in the normal vector is indicated by this covariant derivative, yeah? And since we want something that is defined with, uh, in, the sp in, in the space and not in space-time, we, we apply these uh, projectors that uh, gives us, like, uh, returns us to the, uh, to the spatial component. So this object, which is the covariant derivative of normal vector uh, projected, gives you this k, which is the extrinsic curvature, which indicates us how the hypersurface is curved in a higher dimensional manifold. Uh, and uh, it is a symmetric tensor. It measures how the normal vector to the hypersurface changes. Um, it measures the rate at which the hypersurface deforms and uh, it is carried a all normal. And I think now, yes, now I have the examples, uh, which is very good for getting all these concepts. So this is the example that I already gave to you. This is the plane, uh, the normal vector is always perpendicular, doesn't change. Therefore, this hypersurface doesn't have any 
extrinsic curvature, yes? But also, there is a concept of intrinsic curvature, how this plane curves with respect to itself, not without with any notion of any higher surface. So you can see that the angles of a triangle, uh, the, the, the sum of the angles is pi, so there is no curvature. This plane has explicit curvature zero and intrinsic curvature zero. Another example is the cylinder. Yes. Uh, in the cylinder, uh, it's a bit more. We are getting a little bit more uh, complicated because we have two directions in which to uh, transport the, the, the normal the normal vector. So one way is to go, for instance, along this direction, the direction of Z, and you see that the normal vector doesn't change. So we don't have any curvature in this direction. But in this direction, we have some change of the normal vector. So somehow it is curved in one direction, not in the other. Uh, so which means is that the existing curvature of this hypersurface is not zero only in one direction, in this direction. It is zero in this direction. And now, what happens with the intrinsic curvature of this cylinder? What is the intrinsic curvature of the cylinder? Is like how the cylinder is curved on, on this surface. So if I take this plane and I become it, I, I convert it in a cylinder, do you think it has any intrinsic curvature? No? Why? Yeah, exactly. I can do the same. Like I just don't think in another dimension and I just check that it, I can draw a triangle and the triangle still the angle is some 180 degrees. Yeah? But now, what happens with the sphere? Here is kind of different, no? I have two directions. This direction, normal vector changes. This direction, normal vector changes. So existing curvature regarding to the higher dimension is not vanishing along both directions. Actually, you can also take like some mixed direction and it will also change. So explicit curvature is always non vanishing. And regarding the explicit curvature, this, it doesn't vanish either, right? Because you have some, you also have that this, I cannot convert this plane into a cylinder without changing somehow the topology, right? So this is a, it's topologically different from the plane. Therefore, it has some, some sort of a curvature, which is the intrinsic curvature, which I don't define with any normal vector. It's just intrinsic property of the hypersurface. Yeah. So this is more or less how the concepts uh, how the concepts go. And I'm glad that you're happy with the uh, examples. So now we will get more harder. So we can also define an acceleration of uh, of the normal vector, which is the technical and derivative of normal vector you project into the normal vector itself, and you get some sort of acceleration. Uh, so it's not only velocity, it's also acceleration. And in this curvature, uh, as I showed you previously, covering the derivative of the normal vector, uh, can be uh, defined in terms of the acceleration. Not here that the difference is that these indices are the same, and here they are different, and they are projected. So in this curvature, you can express it like covalent derivative of normal vector minus the acceleration projected on the, on the normal vector. Yeah? So different ways of writing the, the explicit curvature. And obviously, in these examples that I give to you, I'm not ha I don't have any time here. So space time is even more complicated than this. You have to add one extra dimension, which fortunately you can take uh, care of with uh, tensors. With tensors, you don't have to care how many dimensions you have. You just work. Yeah, that's a beauty, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful thing about mathematics. Now, uh, the, I think you have seen, uh, I think I've heard about the concept of Lie derivative. Uh, Lie derivatives I take with respect to a vector and I can apply them to any tensor. Uh, this tensor can be tensor with indices down, indices up, one up and one down, uh, 20 indices, 20 indices. And you have different generalization, different terms. But in particular, I'm interested in this uh, rank through tensor and the Lie derivative with respect to a, nor to a vector goes like this, yeah? This uh, becomes the traditional partial derivative and you have some terms to correct here. 
which go with the derivatives of the vector. And now, an, al an alternative expression for the GC curvature is in terms of the derivative along the normal vector. So you can prove, I'm not proving because we don't have too much time, that the lead derivative with respect to the normal vector of the intrinsic curvature, sorry, of the <laughs> intrinsic metric is some factor for the extrinsic curvature. So somehow this definition is telling you that uh, extrinsic curvature can also be understood and how changes the, the, the your hypersurface, how changes related to the normal vector, yeah, in the direction of the normal vector. Also, another definition I can get that I can take is the mean curvature. This mean curvature, you can contract these indices, and I can get a scalar. And this scalar somehow it, it has some uh, nice uh, geometric interpretation because this uh, mean curvature it goes like proportional to the uh, logarithm of the square root of the determinant of the metric. Somehow it is. Uh, defining some sort of, of, of volume that encloses the, uh, uh, the intrinsic metric. And some, it, it is very important later for numerical relativity because you can take some, for instance, in, in black holes, you can take some surface like uh, that uh, minimizes, let's say, the, the volume. Uh, and then uh, it is related with the mean curvature. So some, some space times they have zero mean curvature, for instance, or they minimize. Uh, but that, uh, uh, I don't think we will have time to, to check it, but it, it starts from here. And now, uh, we are getting even more hard. Uh, we are getting even more hard in mathematics uh, because we will uh, have to include somehow the curvature with all these definitions. So what are we going to do? Are we are going to compute the double covalent derivative of any vector, yes? And then uh, you can prove that this expression, okay, we saw like several slides ago that the covalent derivative of the permutation of the covalent derivative of a vector, it, it is related with the three-dimensional uh, Ricci, uh, sorry, Riemann. Three-dimensional Riemann tensor is like the permutation of covalent derivatives. But now I only have one derivative. I have one derivative of the of, of a vector, and this I can express like uh, the index, the extrinsic curvature times the vector, the extrinsic curvature the covalent derivative of the vector along the normal vector projected in the uh, in space and uh, three projections of the three uh, indices of the covalent derivative of the of the vector yeah and here uh, yeah i have to remind you of this uh, expression and take into account here that these covalent derivatives they are different yeah these are the ones on the these are the ones on the hypersurface and these ones are on space time. They are different dimensional covalent derivatives. Yeah? Because this one is the one that we associated with three dimensional space time. And these ones, they are related with the full four dimensional space time. And then, uh, when, using this, uh, when using all these definitions, you can combine all the previous equations and prove uh, that there is a relation between the four dimensional. Uh, Riemann tensor, the three-dimensional Riemann tensor, and the existing curvature. So this is called the Gauss-Kodachi equation. Uh, I, here I'm not using any Lagrangian to obtain Einstein's equations, but these expressions, they are related. Uh, you, I, I, I will show you that all these equations that we are deriving, they are directly related with Einstein's equations. Yeah? So still I cannot show you that. I will be able to show you that in the in the last lecture. But this first equation is very important because it gives you a notion of relating the full four-dimensional space-time with the curvature in three dimensions and the explicit curvature. So uh, if you make a little bit of uh, physical interpretation here, 
you have that all the 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 time evolution of your intrinsic metric is encoded here. It is, it is encoded in the uh, intrinsic curvature. Here is all the dynamics. This term it only has a spatial derivatives, so it doesn't have any dynamics. Yes. So this is what you will find, like in the let's say in the uh, either Einstein equations or in the Lagrangian of general relativity. You find four-dimensional quantities, and now I was able to split it in something that is non-dynamical and something that is dynamic. That's why this equation is so important. And now, uh, I can derive another identity from considering projections of the Riemann tensor along the normal direction, because now here I was just predicting the Riemann tensor in the spatial sector, but now I can also predict the Riemann tensor along the normal direction. And for that, uh, I first have to take the covariant derivative of the stasis curvature. This is the spatial covariant derivative, and it becomes, uh, the, let's say, the, the covariant derivative of the four-dimensional spacetime of the stasis curvature. And then, uh, I can compute the permutation of these indices, the mu and nu of this expression, and then I obtain the four-dimensional Riemann tensor. So somehow here I get the four-dimensional dynamics of the Riemann tensor projected along the normal, one direction projected along the normal vector, the other three projected in space, and this is equivalent to uh, a let's say, commutation of covariant derivative of the existing curvature. And this is another equation, which is called the kodachi Mainardi equation. And with this equation, and with gauss kodachi equation, I will be able to find uh, all the constraints for general relativity and the time evolution of the variables that are really uh, dynamical in general relativity. And I think for now, uh, ooh. <laughs> I think that's everything, <laughs> because there is, doesn't appear anymore. <laughs> and I will see you uh, in one hour uh, for the next lecture. So, yeah. Well, if you have questions, you can ask, of course. <laughs> or you can ask later.